Hi there. How y'all doing today? Hello. You can take that with you if you want to. Uh, it's okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Coach, the chair will just be careful and sit down. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon and welcome back to the NCAA Division I Women's Basketball Press Conference featuring the Yukon Huskies, winners from the Portland Three Regional. We'll hear an opening statement from coach and follow with questions from our student athletes. The student athletes will then be dismissed and will head to the mix zone for additional interview opportunities and we'll open up the floor for questions for coach. Additionally, at that time, the locker room will be open for media availability. Coach Ariama, at this time, if you could give us a brief opening statement, then we'll go to questions to the student athletes. Thank you. Um, well, I'm sure like every other coach, you know, it's, um, it's a thrill to be, to be here and to have the opportunity to play. Um, you know, some years it's like you're planning in October and you know that if everything goes right, you have an opportunity to, to play in this tournament on the final weekend. And, and some years it goes according to plan and other years, your plan doesn't necessarily hold, and you've got to make some adjustments and all the other stuff that goes into zigging and zagging to try to get your team ready to play, and all the pitfalls that happen. And this year certainly was one of the most challenging uh, seasons of my career. And um, I have a lot of admiration, and I'm really proud of my team, and especially these three. Uh, for everything they've been through the last four years and for them to be here right now um, in this spot is um, is probably one of the most gratifying things that I've had to experience in all, uh, all my 40 years at Connecticut. We're going to take our first question to our right ladies. Nancy, if you can proceed, raise your hand so they can see you. Nancy Armour, USA Today Sports. Paige, um, so much of the attention this season has been on Caitlin and, and how you know she's kind of elevated the game. That kind of attention was starting to be on you early in your career, and I'm wondering how you feel about having that spotlight shift back to you or, or maybe grow even larger and hotter on you next year. Uh, I think media coverage is important for the game. I think it grows the game. I think I know freshman year I was like the media darling. Everybody was like focused on me and what I did at UConn my freshman year. But I think it's more important for the game to share the spotlight, to grow the game and show all the stars of college basketball and not just focus on one particular player, um, whether it be me, Caitlin, Juju, Angel. I mean, there's so many um, names in college basketball now that are that are huge, that are stars, that are that deserve credit and I think it's not my job but the media can do a better job of just making sure everybody gets love everybody gets not equal amount of attention but try to spread it out more um, so I honestly hope next year um, I'm not the, the the vocal point and the only person that gets attention um, and I hope as media as players we can spread the love a little bit more we're going to stay to our right Lindsay Lindsay Schnell, USA Today. Um, Paige, you've talked about, you know, you wanted this so badly to have the big moment again um, last year when you were injured. I wondered if after winning uh, the regional, did you ever get five minutes to yourself to kind of reflect on what you've done? And were you emotional again? Or have you just been go, go, go and no time for that? Yeah, I think after the game, when I got back to my hotel room, I kind of actually processed what just happened. Um, and going through the entire journey and how it's all played out and just reflected on the whole entire year to see where we are now was really rewarding and, like Coach said, gratifying. So I think definitely after the game, your adrenaline's still going. You're just so excited about the next steps and, like, we, we made it to the Final Four. Um, but after we got back to the hotel, we sort of celebrated together, spent some time together. You really just soak it in and enjoy it. We're going to stay to our center, gentlemen from The Athletic. Paige and Aaliyah, for, for both of you, camera with The Athletic. I, I'm curious, 
Nika does a lot for you guys that maybe doesn't get seen in like big headlines and things of that nature, but how does she make the game easier for both of you when she's engaged, out of foul trouble, and, and, all, and on the floor? If we could start with Aaliyah. Yeah, Nika does a lot for our team. Um, I think that she's just the, the steady beat that really helps us go, helps us slow down, helps us just play at the pace that we need to play at on the defensive end, um, you know, controlling the, the, the pace of the defense. And it's just a ripple down effect all the way down to the back line. So I think she sets the tone on the defensive end. And offensively, just her leadership and just her controlling what we need to execute, uh, what coach asks of, ask of us to execute. And I think that she's just a great leader. And, um, you know, being a senior and playing alongside her for um, our last dance, you know, I think that she's really grown into this position and um, it's come a long way and more people should notice that. Yeah, I think, I mean, she's just like the calming presence on our team. Uh, offensively, she gets us in our sets. Um, she, she's just um, everything we need as a leader. Uh, she says everything she needs to say in huddles um, and then she controls what we do on defense, always takes the toughest assignment um, and doesn't care about the credit, doesn't care who gets what and just shows up every day at practice as the same player um, and same leader for us. So she makes everything easier on, on both sides of the floor. We're going to take our next question from Zoom. Jamie from CBC, um, you are now unable to unmute your line. Hi, uh, this is a question uh, for Aaliyah. Obviously, there's been a tremendous focus on kind of the moment that women's basketball is having uh, south of the border. A lot of people uh, up here in Canada uh, keeping a an eye on you. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the impact uh, that you think that this kind of moment might be having north of the border and, uh, and how it might impact the game here? I'm just grateful for the platform that I've been given um, playing on at, at elite school like UConn because not only it's open doors for me and opportunities for me, but also opportunities for you know those upcoming in Canada. And I think the impact that I've been able to to continue to lead after you know Kia came here um, was just showing. Canadians that uh, we can not only be dominant just within Canada, but coming across the border and seeing how special you can get a lot more opportunities in the NCAA and, you know, going for a scholarship and um, be becoming a student athlete and um, eventually going pro. So I'm just grateful to be put in this position and kind of impact from a distance. I know I get a lot of support and a lot of love from home and um, even when um, Coach made it happen where I had a homecoming game in Canada. I think that was a big step for just women's basketball in Canada because as our national t team continues to grow, I think we're also just growing women's basketball in, gen in general. We're not only a hockey country, we're trying to be a basketball country as well. So um, a lot of love up north and I appreciate all of you. We're gonna move to our right. If you could raise your hand so they can see Sorry. you. I will Graves, Associated Press for the players. Gino was talking on Tuesday and joking sort of how I, I tell my assistants it feels like a house all year. It feels like a house of cards. It's going to come tumbling down, whatever. Uh, talking about the injuries and just, but internally, did it really feel like that? Or all the all the stuff that you guys dealt with, or did it feel like in a weird way, in a way, it made you guys maybe maybe tougher and brought out a resilience that maybe you know you weren't sure was going to be required when the journey started? If we could start with Nika, um, I would think both can be true. You know, when you're dealt with so many things that are unexpected and you're kind of, you know, sick of all those injuries and um, all the cha challenges thrown your way, I feel like at first it's obviously a shock. You know, it's a morning stage that you have to go through with your team, with yourself. Um, but as the time goes on, you kind of realize that you can either sit here and keep mourning forever or you can just, you know, um, step up for your team and you know, play for the people that are also on the bench that cannot play because you know we are very lucky and privileged right now to be able to you know play and be out there because we know how hard it is um, to not be able to you know, especially some people like Paige that have been in that position before. Um, so I'm sure we're taking every second to you know appreciate our time on the court, and I'm sure it made us tougher in the end. I mean, we're here, so and nobody expected us to be here, and that only means that. We used all of those things to 
make each other tough. And Aaliyah? Um, yeah, uh, pretty much everything Nika said. I think one of the things that we learned is just leaning more on each other, um, playing more as a unit, um, and just playing for something bigger than just the win. You know, as, as Nika said, playing for those who cannot play, but also just trying to prove ourselves right that we're still in this, we're still going to play the UConn way, and we still hold ourselves to the standard. Um, I know a lot of people are counting us out, so just playing with that extra motivation to um, play to win. Lastly, Paige, do you have anything to add? Um, I mean, they said a lot. I would just say we kind of shifted our focus to not focusing on what we don't have, but just appreciating what we do um, and just picking up each other, relying, relying on each other's strength. Um, the coaching staff has done a really good job of just instilling confidence in, in us. We instill confidence within each other that no matter who we have, um, we're confident in the group that can go out there. Alexa. Alexa Philip, ESPN, for any of you, you guys have played Iowa two times in your careers. I know Paige wasn't in the, the one last time. Can you take anything from those games? Does it feel like that it's just the teams are too different, or how do you kind of view those experiences before as maybe helping you going into tomorrow? We'll begin again with Nika. Um, I feel like it's definitely maybe a little helpful, you know, to have played them twice already. But at the same time, it's completely different teams. It's completely different. Um, it's going to be a completely different atmosphere. Um, it's a much more important game now. So I feel like once you count all those things in, I don't think you can really compare um, those previous two games to this one. But can we, you know, watch the watch the game and take some things that we did well against them and we, that we didn't do well? Yes, of course. But um, I feel like we're more focusing on us and our game. Um, I feel like that has been the main point for us throughout this whole tournament, you know, to obviously study them and um, get our defensive offensive plan. But I feel like our game is what um, we're trying to get much more focus on. I feel like that's going to be the main point. James. James Watkins, Cleveland.com. Uh, for, for the players, all three of you guys. Don Staley used the term held back when talking about what the coverage of this sport used to be, not enough exposure, particularly on a national level. I'm just curious, as, as people who have grown up consuming it and now playing in it, how have you seen the coverage of this sport evolve? We'll start with Aaliyah. Um, it's evolved so much. Um, coming in as freshmen, like we came in when it was bubble season, so not really playing in front of big crowds, not really getting a lot of TV. TV coverage, I, I know like from Canada, like there is nothing streaming across the border, but now there's more coverage nationally, internationally, and just more people buying into women's basketball. So um, I think it's just great to be a part of. Um, it's a long time coming, and I think it's going to grow even larger. Take our last question from Jonathan Tannewald up in the front. Hi, Jonathan Tannenwald of the Philadelphia Inquirer. This one's for Paige. Um, there was a question a moment ago about your the past games against Iowa. And I know you, when you played against Caitlin, it was three years ago, and the circumstances were totally different against because of the pandemic and everything else. But what are your memories of that game? And given how long you've known Caitlin for, which she also talked about when she was up here, you know, what's it like going up against somebody who you've known for so long, and I would think pretty well, in as big a spotlight as this? Thank you. Yeah, I remember uh, freshman year, obviously the bubble. Um, I think it was a Sweet 16 game. Uh, I remember Kristen having a really big game. Um, I was just playing a great team game. I think that's the game I slapped you on your butt. Yes. Yeah, so that was a fun game. Uh, but I just, I, I know Caitlin, of course, we go way back. Um, Midwestern, we had a lot of battles in AAU and stuff like that. We played together on Team USA. I think she's, she's just a competitor. She wants to win. Um, she has uh, just intangibles of the game. She knows how to play, a great IQ. Um, but I think the biggest thing about her is she competes. And she's just a winner. She wants to win at all costs. And so I, I know going into that, um, it'll be a great matchup. Um, but I'm excited. It's, it's great for the game um, and to be at this level, on this high of stakes, to see where we were in AAU competing against each other. Um, it's just really cool to see. 
Paige, Aaliyah, Nika, thank you very much for your time today and best of luck tomorrow. Thank you. At this time, we'll open up for questions for Coach. We'll start with Doug. We'll work our way around. Please proceed. Hey, Coach. Uh, Doug Feinberg, the AP. It's good to see you. Um, you've had some of the greatest players in the history of women's basketball play for you. You've had some of the greatest teams. You've had the greatest streaks ever. I remember you saying at one point, no one's going to care unless we lose when those streaks are going on. No one's going to put it on top of Sports Center. No one's going to play it nationally. But it seems the last two years, women's basketball as a whole is getting more attention than some could say the men's tournament. I mean, the players, the names and such, the, the ratings. Have you seen a shift? Have you seen something that like we're finally getting attention we deserve as opposed to needing something like a loss after 111 straight game wins to get the attention that we're getting now? Yeah, I, I think when you're in, when you're in the middle of it, you maybe don't don't see um, the they say you know the forest from the trees or something like that. But um, during during those during those moments where we were getting the majority of the attention, and I, I remember one time somebody asked one of the coaches before the NCAA tournament. Do you have a preference of who's going to win? Who you want to win the the NCAA tournament? And it's a longtime coach too. And they said, "I don't care as long as it's not Tennessee or Connecticut." You know, there was this point where people were, you know, dying for some some other storyline to appear. And um, you know, and there probably were some storylines, but nobody re really wanted to pay attention. There weren't enough people. Um, that uh, that they could look into what all the other storylines were, and um, but now you know there's way more opportunities for storylines. There's more uh, outlets for storylines, and I also think the the, the women's game is, is benefiting and is going to continue to benefit from the fact that players are around long enough to create a name, create a buzz. Um, you know, people weren't even mentioning Caitlin Clark when Paige was a freshman. It was all Paige, 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 Paige. And, um, and now it's all Caitlin, Caitlin, Caitlin. So it's, had she left after her freshman year, like it would have been if she was a guy, or Paige left, if, they would have had to find somebody else. And if that person wasn't there, then you wouldn't have had the ability to do all this that's happened. So I think these players staying for four years, staying at, at the same school hopefully, um, gives it a chance to grow. And it gives people a chance to fall in love with, with these kids. Um, so I think that's been the, one of the biggest you know, forces that I've seen from, from my vantage point. And, um, and I like how all these other coaches uh, are getting a ton of attention and a lot of pressure being put on them to have to win. <laughs> you know, they always thought I had it easy. Well, now they realize, you know, they wish that they could go back to being anonymous, you know, and uh, so I'm kind of relishing this. Coach, so. oh, I'm sorry, didn't mean to cut no, you off. No, no. Awesome. We're going to stay to um, our right. We're going to go to the back and then we'll work our way back up front. I see you. I'll try and get to everybody. Danielle Lerner, Houston Chronicle. Along those same lines, Gino, there have been so many phenomenal individual matchups throughout this tournament, and it seems like a large portion of the coverage is devoted to those matchups. Do you think that women's college basketball as a whole has become more star-driven in the past like 10 years or so? I believe so. Um, it's a star-driven society that we live in. You know, it's a celebrity-driven, star-driven, uh, influencer driven you know world that that that's been created and you know we always talk about the evolution of women's basketball you know and how um, we started so much later than the men did and it takes a little bit of time to catch up and I felt like our run was you know described by other people as you know the UCLA time of the 70s, okay? And Magic and Bird, 
TV all of a sudden started paying more attention. People don't realize that when, was, when all those teams were winning, all those games back then, there wasn't really a lot of attention placed on them. You know, Final Fours on the men's side were being played in 18,000 seat arenas, and I'm not sure they completely sold out, you know? But then all of a sudden, those two particular players came on, and it just lit everything up, and it just took off from there. So it, it needs some stars, it needs people that have the right personality, the right game, um, and we have that now. And it's not that we didn't have it before. You know, all those great, just using our example, all those great Tennessee, Connecticut games, they were all Hall of Famers playing against each other on a national stage. But it was then. And now those same types of players are really benefiting from all of this. They've been there before, but it's just, it just feels different now. We're going to stay to our right. We'll go to Nancy. We're going to work our way back to the gentleman in the striped shirt, and then I'll work my way up. Gino, Nancy Armour, USA Today Sports. Kind of following up on that, we've seen times where it looked like women's teams or women's sports was kind of going to get over the hump. Uh, 96 Olympics, some of your teams, 99 World Cup. Does this feel different, and, and why do you think that is? Uh, I remember I used to, um, I, I didn't know how to feel when people, friends of mine and just people in general, would, you know, we would get 16,000 people for every one of our games because we had Diana. And everybody said, yeah, you know, she's the only player I like to watch because she plays like a guy. Like that was the defining, that was the validation that you needed to have in order for anyone to appreciate who you are, what your talents are, what you bring, you know, as an athlete, forget as a, as a woman or as a man. And fans of women's basketball were fans of their teams. So when it got to the biggest stage, if your team wasn't involved, there wasn't like a, a national consciousness of, hey, we need to watch this. And I think it's gone beyond that, that now, because of what some of these kids have done. You know, they've created a, a, a fan base of women's basketball that they'll watch a great women's game, regardless of whether they have a rooting interest or not in the game. That they will, will go to the game, not just because it's their team playing. But you know, that's taken some time, but it's, it is, it's there now. And where it goes from here, I think, is going to be really, really important. You know? I think this is a, this is a, it, it's a moment, like people are saying, but it's more than a moment, you know? Sometimes moments become minutes, and minutes become hours, and hours become days, and next thing you know, it becomes part of the national pastime. Coach, we're going to stay to our right on the back corner. Coach, Dan Lobby, Cleveland.com. You mentioned Paige's freshman year. It was all Paige, Paige, Paige. Had she stayed healthy, how, how do you think people would be talking about her today? Would she have the same profile, do you think, as Caitlin? Same profile? Um, they, have, they have two dis two different types of games, you know? Um, um, I think when your team wins and wins a lot, I think you draw a lot of attention to um, – to yourself, you know, when people say, uh, who's the best player? Well, um, who's the best team? I mean, that's as it happens in the pros, right? Who's the best player in the country? Who's the most valuable player in, in America? Well, let's go look at the best team and pick their best player. That's usually a pretty good guess. And had we kept winning, you know, I don't know that Paige would be any bigger or less talked about and I don't know that she would have the kind of impact that Caitlin's had because they have different, different personalities, different games. They approach the game differently. And it works for, for both of them, you know. Um, so I don't, I don't know, but it would have been nice to find out. We're going to come up. We're going to do the second row of the gentleman in a gray shirt. I see you. <laughs> and then we'll work our way over. Gino Kenny wrote a WHBC radio. With Paige and Caitlin, you mentioned Bird and Magic, 
and they elevated the college game. That's when match or March Madness really kind of kicked off. But then they took it to the NBA level, and that grew. Can Paige and Caitlin do that for the WNBA? Uh, they can. Uh, th they can. But like I've said before, there were a lot of great NBA players before Magic and, and Larry Bird. And so why didn't it happen? People didn't make it happen. So those two guys, because they did it in college and people saw them play a lot, they wanted to follow them after they left. So the WNBA hasn't had the benefit of these great players that have come along. They didn't have the following. They didn't have the hysteria that these kids have. So there wasn't a, I want to follow them. So hopefully this will change that narrative. But the WNBA is going to have to do a great job of marketing these guys. And the, NBA, the WNBA, I don't think, has done a great, great enough job of marketing their individual stars for whatever reason, because there's been a lot of them. And maybe now I think it'll change. Um, but certainly they, they've, let, they've, they've laid the groundwork for it, 100%. We're going to stay in this row, gentlemen, with the teal. Then we'll go this direction. Uh, Joe Zone, CBS Hartford. Gino, a lot of players might get caught up in a one-in-one -one showdown on national TV. What is it about Paige that will not allow her to get caught up in that? Um, who says it won't? I mean, you know, kids are competitive. They want to win. Uh, they, know, they know what's going on out there. They know who's who. They know what's what. And... Uh, Caitlin comes down and makes a huge three. Don't think the page is going to pass the next one up and pass it to somebody. Um, so I think there will be a little bit of that, but it won't be. Uh, if I score more points than Caitlin, Connecticut's going to win. It won't be that at all, and it won't be. I have, to, you know, I have to match everything that she does. That's, you know, that's that's what I was saying. You know, Paige's personality is such that um, she'd rather score 10 points and us win than get 50 and us lose. So I think it's going to be about winning the game more, more than anything else. Coach, we're going to take a question to our left. If you could raise your hand so Coach can see you. Gino, Nick Camino from WKYC-TV here in Cleveland. Um, yesterday we had an opportunity. We were covering USA basketball practice, and uh, Diana Tarazi was there. and. We we're talking about how there's always storylines and narratives and everybody's saying, you know, you guys aren't supposed to be here. And, and Diana assured me, she said, you kind of expected to be there. So I'm wondering if you can balance that storyline of, hey, we're not supposed to be here, almost an underdog mentality, which feels weird for you. And for her to say, trust me, they expected to be there. <laughs> uh, if you'd have talked to me in June this year, I would tell you, yeah, it was going to be us in North Car us in South Carolina playing for the national championship. And then as things started to happen, I started to believe something different. You, you, you have to be realistic. And, and, and we live in a world at UConn where the expectations are unrealistic. But you have to be realistic. You, know, you have to look at your team and you have to say, do we have an answer for everything that happens? And if the answer is no, then you just have to cross your fingers and hope that that thing doesn't happen, or those two things that you know you have no answer for. Okay, so there's a lot of things we don't have an answer for in tomorrow's game. Now, does that mean that we just wanted to hope we make the round of 64 and then see what happens? No, because our players will tell you this. They say, you know, playing at Connecticut is the greatest thing ever. But playing at Connecticut is hard as hell because if two guys foul out tomorrow, we're supposed to be able to compete five against three because that's the, that's the illogical, delusional, you know, expectations that exist up there. Um, so, yeah, there was always a, yeah, we can get there, but everything has to be done perfectly. And in my mind, I had a lot of plans for this weekend. This didn't include this. 
Coach, we'll take our final question. Uh, back row to the right, if you could raise your hand so the coach can see you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Aaron Barzlai from Her Hoop Stats. Coach, even with everything that you've accomplished and the program's accomplished in your time there, there's probably millions of people watching a UConn women's basketball game for the first time on Friday night. What do you hope they take away about you and about the program when they're reflecting on it tomorrow or Saturday or something like that? Uh, uh, you know, that's the one that that's the one thing that we probably, you know, we don't talk about winning a lot. You know, we don't discuss winning a lot at UConn. Svelana Brasimova, my Russian kid, taught me that. You know, and Coach, why do we always talk about winning a national championship? Everybody knows that's why we're here, so stop talking about it. So we don't talk about that a lot, but we do talk about you cannot manage people's perception of you, who you are, what you are. And the world that these kids live in, that we all live in, is everybody has an opinion of you, and they don't know you, they don't never met you, they don't know anything about you, so they see you one time, and right away they formulate an opinion, good or bad, okay? So there's a lot of people um, that hope we lose by 100 on, uh, on Friday. And there's a lot of people that hope we win by 100. So. There are some people that are going to watch us for the very first time and say, what's the big deal about these people? And hopefully they see that we play basketball a certain way and that um, we try to conduct ourselves a certain way and that our game looks a certain way. Um, and that, you know, we are who we are and we compete. And what you think of us or what your impression of us is, I have no control over that. But you know one thing that I've noticed over the years that's happened? When people see us play for the very first time, two things happen. One, they fall in love with all my players because of the way they play and the way they conduct themselves. And they go, yeah, he really is a shithead. <laughs> so those two things will still be true on Friday. Thank you so much for your time, Coach. And best of luck on Friday. <laughs> And that's just my family. <laughs> As a reminder, a recording of this press conference will be posted in the NCAA Digital Media Hub at www.ncaa.veritone.com. Quite welcome. Our next press conference will begin at 2.35 p.m. Eastern Time.